Welcome to your favorite comic book channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey, author of I Am Stan. Big one today uh, for all you comic book makers out there. But first, got to let you guys know about the uh, Cartoonist Kayfabe Comic Book Christmas in July initiative that we are presenting for the second year in a row. Uh, we are increasing comic book awareness by creating a uh, true free comic book day. Last Saturday of July, we're going around to the free little lending libraries in our neighborhoods, and we are stuffing those free little lending libraries full of comics, uh, be it doubles, comp copies from your publisher, go out and spend 20 bucks at the dollar bins and buy some comics that you would love to share with people, and uh, increase comic awareness. We all got introduced to comics in uh, accidental ways, and uh, a good percentage of those people might go on to uh, become future comic readers, and maybe even makers. Uh, the Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon is where the King Kayfabers mitigate the Kayfabe effect. Uh, the videos we talk about, the things we talk about on these videos, become prohibitively expensive in the aftermarket. The King Kayfabers see the first things that we're doing before anybody else through our live stream process, during our recording session, and we deliver them videos before anybody else. Jimmy, this is a video I've been wanting to make for quite some time, and the uh, we are makers and purveyors of artisanal comics. James Rugg? James Tiberius Rugg? <laughs> but but uh, a lot of these methods, you know, like we, we use paper and uh, some of these tools, highly esoteric to uh, the, the lay comic fan who might draw their stuff or comic maker who might draw their stuff in Clip Studio or, or Procreate. And I, I thought it would be pretty fun to show off a good sample of this arcane technology uh, in the coming years. We are going to be holding a kind of a monopoly by being the last cartoonists that work on paper, which is a pretty uh, advantageous position the more the years go by. You know, you got your guys at like Felix Comic Art. That might be the last dudes <laughs> who, are, who are drawing on paper. Uh, so there, there are things that have been taken care of with the computer, but it's a digital version of things that we arrived at earlier. Yeah, and... I don't know about an age cutoff, but I mean, like, we all learned to draw on paper. There was no digital option when you're little kids and you're just learning to draw. And it's one of the things that always keeps me going back to paper. I've made comics completely digitally, but I like the actual, like, I don't want to stare at a screen anymore today. Let me look at paper. When I first started making comics, I was looking at a screen nine hours a day for a day job. Yeah. And I came home and all I wanted to do was not look at a screen. And I've been drawing on paper up to that point 20 years. So... Yes, paper, uh, there, there's something gratifying about it to me. So let's knock out the simple ones uh, sure. first. At this point now, you got your uh, Raphael Kalinsky number two sable hair, which is uh, the, the Excalibur to the brush inker of today. This has replaced the number two Windsor Newton sable hair. Uh, yeah, the famous Series 7 that this, they yes. talk about in How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way and virtually any cartooning book from, say, the 1980s back, yeah. because that goes all the way to the... I've got How to Draw Comic books from the 30s. Mm -hmm. They all talk about that Winsor-Newton. I have never had a Winsor-Newton Series 7 that was not split. Right. And I've spent probably $150 on a series <laughs> of them over the years, but the Raphael brush for me, I've gone through, you know, a dozen of those and I've never had a problem with one. Not a bad idea to keep these uh, tips. Uh, you wash it out diligently when you're done using it. Uh, some people even use straight up shampoo and you could actually, when, in, when you're washing them out, you could be rough because you need to get the ink out of the ferrule. Is it ferrule? Ferrule? Mm -hmm. Like you need to get the ink out of there and you can literally mash it into your hand so that it splays out all the way. Go like that until all the you see no ink coming off. Uh, what the guys, what Uncle Joe did, and and what I still do to this day after a point, put it in the mouth, get that tip back, put put this back on there, and it'll preserve the tip longer than if you don't maintain. Yeah, the other tip I would give everybody because I've done a good bit of brush inking, um, wash it out every half hour, you know, every twenty five minutes. Um, you don't want to, you do two hours with these things, you will do damage. And what happens in the way they damage is the bristles will start to break off. Yeah. And so like, I have a bunch of brushes where they started out like this, those right. look great. And now there's like four hairs left. <laughs> uh -huh. And you know, that becomes that limp fish because these snap back into point. Yeah. And that's what allows you to do that thin, thick, thin that uh, brushes really can't be duplicated with other media. You mentioned shampoo. 
I would use conditioner after I was That's done on good. the brushes to kind of give them a little extra. Let's keep it pushing, man, because we've got <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of tools to talk about here. This episode is brought to you by the Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon. Three different levels of participation at our Patreon, but if you become a King Kayfaber, you get all of the videos before anybody else gets to see them uh, and it mitigates the kayfabe effect you get first dibs on the things that we talk about plus uh, you have access to the live stream recording sessions where we record a week's worth of videos giving you even uh, more exclusive access uh, before anybody else ultimately the videos are brought to you by the books that we make and we have a big year in 2023 the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is coming to you in time for the holiday season 504 pages of comics in here uh that which represents the four volumes of hip-hop family tree plus uh, 140 pages of comics and material that are not in those first four volumes of hip-hop family tree x-men grand design trilogy collects all of my x-men grand design work in one handy dandy trade paperback some of that is out of print at the moment the current focus is red room crypto killers Issue number three is forthcoming and is going to be a hotkey because it is establishing a version of the characters that I'm exploring in my daily comic strip, which will be serializing on my Patreon to start uh, at, a link, at the link in the description below. Jimmy has a nice plethora of materials out there. The Princess of Poverty book is coming to you in November, in time for the holidays. Uh, it represents all of uh, Jim's Street Angel comics. If you have the Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive as a companion piece. Hulk Grand Design is the Marvel comic that Jim put together, but the newest effort uh, that is currently out of print but going to be getting uh, another print run is True Crime Funnies, and uh, make sure you connect with Jim at his website for that. Now that we're done paying the bills, back to the video. The adjacent cousin to the brush is, is the... Uh is the dip pen and we got a sample of nibs here ranging from uh like gillette points like yep. the mapping points and things to these ditties which are the classic lettering nibs yeah absolutely there's two varieties of these if you look closely you'll see like one is the c nib that has kind of a rounded point yeah blunt. that was very popular the other one is basically a chisel tip like a calligraphy tip right and between those two, I've lettered comics, some of my early Street Angels. Some of the stuff that'll be in Princess of Poverty was lettered with some of these lettering nibs. Uh, they're interesting. I don't use them now for lettering. I, I use markers, but I recommend, man, if you have any interest in this stuff, play with these because they're very, very fun. You see, like, there's a there's some big bluntness to, mm -hmm. to some of them, and that would be conducive to the scale that you're drawing the strips in if you take a look at like old ec cigar strips or dick tracy these things are more than twice up and you can get away with doing a very very thick line maybe on 11 by 17 piece of paper uh this would be specific and exclusive to very very bold kind of shouting or something my teacher at the cubert school uh phil felix used a hunt 102 to do his comic book lettering a little bit thinner line. Dave Cooper uses the Hunt 102 for lettering. That's how I started doing, and I've done, you know, lettering with the Hunt 102. Boy, I tip my cap to the people who can make that look good and work for them, because that is not an easy tool to letter with. Totally. And, and the chisel tip, uh, the place where you would see that would be like the Walt Kelly lettering, or uh, Kevin Nolan would uh, letter that his his works that way. So you would, basically, you hold it the same at the same position every time you make your strokes, and you get, you know, a thin line pulling down and two thick lines going across or a thick line going down and two thins or going, you know. And according vertically. to the interview in Draw Magazine, Kevin Nolan would actually file down his tips to make his own chisel tip. That's it. Out of like a, uh, a mapping tip. So that that is uh, the other place that you see it, Ed, is on splash pages and like cover lettering from the Silver Age Marvel books. That's where you would see some of those bigger round tips used mm -hmm. for like very bold outlines on letters, too. Yeah. Yeah, I see you've got your, your what they call the lead holder here, man. Uh, the, the old school drafting pencils. This is what I draw with. Those are my pencils for the most part. One variation is this, and this is like, talk about a garbage tool. <laughs> right, yeah, it feels so thin. I bought this so before cheap. I went on the road just because uh, I was traveling to Europe and I needed to draw, of course. And I was like, I'm going to buy these mechanical pencils. And this thing is, a, I think it's a 1.2. Yeah. These are two millimeters. 
Uh, you'll see this one is probably 0.5 or 0.7, right. but this is this big fat pencil lead. I kind of like drawing that way, especially for roughs because it keeps me from getting crazy with the details. Yeah. Right. But this turned into like my favorite tool. It's triangle <laughs> shaped. You know, sometimes you'll see those. Easy to hold. Yeah, you'll see like things, attachments you can put on a pencil that's that shape so it felt good. And I'd get them at Office Max in packs of 10. Uh, kind of a dumb tool, but I liked it. Like this thing, our, our brethren will get the... Uh callus mm -hmm. and uh i was made fun of fairly recently because like i don't have a callus but like let's see if it shows up well from putting pressure on my finger this way 10 hours a day yes. my middle finger is very crooked <laughs> <laughs> it's very very crooked at the at the tip there man just from pressing on it all day and these are day. the leads that go into those pencils it's a drafting tool yes uh what we're looking at here are non-repro blue leads man non-photo blue whenever you hear that term the advantage of that is you can put down like your your um earliest kind of construction lines and uh you might not even be able to see it on the screen but that is very very faint to give you your indicator and a lot of guys will you know put down something put down something uh pretty pretty gestural pretty faint and then and then pull out you know the bigger shape the more important shape with the gray line. Uh, you didn't bring your pencil sharpener, I did you? I did indeed. So even the pencil sharpener is kind of wild, man. Uh, there's this little thing to. Uh, well, may I? Sure. Uh, so you put your th you put your blunt tip in there. You run it across, and it's it's hitting the uh, sharpener. It feels and very it satisfying. Sharp. Oh yeah. It'll get very sharp as well. So look at that, man. You Probably need, needs emptied, is what you're picking up all that graphite. Yeah. You need this piece to uh, you know get get the flotsam and jetsam off of there then you're good to go yeah and i run uh two of these pencils because i like to keep that blue available yeah. very easily so i run two of these pencils basically at all times one with my graphite and one with the blue although occasionally i will change it up and put red and this is when you're being fancy and trying to make originals that look cool yeah <laughs> it was just something else to look at but it's kind of a pink color whenever you use that red i have a practical uh can can you load off camera can you load me up a red and but keep the blue because there is a practical reason to have both and, and i will show you once we use this thing Whoa. once we put this to to to, uh, to usage man uh this is this is my go-to pen that I use pencil that I use just a 0.5 Pentel. The lead, they I don't know that they make non-photo blue lead, but they do make a blue lead. It is darker than your non-repro blue pencil that we just use here. But I have a light hand, so it doesn't show up. If you have a heavy hand, it's too dark. Like even if you pressed on that earlier blue, it would not be this dark. So uh, you got to have a have a light hand with this. The advantage of this is you don't need to play with the pencil sharpener. Right. It does it does stay tight the entire time. Maybe the disadvantage if you're a compulsive person is you do get into the details of things a little too much if you're uh, in, in penciling mode or something. But uh, the other beauty of not having to sharpen it all the time is it fits in to the uh, Ames lettering guide quite beautifully all the time without ever having to... Uh, do anything, any sort of um, sharpening. Now, I've taught some workshops in my day, Jimmy, across the world, and people uh, people were a little bit confused when I was like, all right, man, time to roll out our panel borders. To do that, you got a flat surface with a, you know, a sharp edge. Real tough when you're uh, on the road. Do you mm -hmm. remember, Tommy, when we shared a hotel room in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, when uh, we stayed at a hotel, you were working on Transformers G.I. Joe. I was working on a weekly Hip Hop Family tree strip. And I was we were working on the road. And you snapped pictures of me using the closet door. Mm -hmm. Because I could not find a sharp surface to put my paper so that I could tape it up. So that I could get accurate, like, panel construct, Like, you know, 90 degree angles. Right. You need a triangle. You need... A T square against a flat surface, it stays there. Now I'm not going to be able to really do this here. We put this together before because the triangle is just too big for this little surface that we have here. But very simple. Make sure that make sure it's butted. Make sure the triangle is butted here. You're getting 90 degree angles every time. That sounds like a no-brainer, but it's not. Uh, so the triangle, that's the crucial piece. To, yeah, uh, I did not bring my triangle. I have a 30, 60 degree drafting triangle that I use. And yeah. It's probably my most used tool. Ames lettering guide. I, I have I have three of these going. Uh, and <laughs> I have two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, when you arrive at the lettering size that you want, which is using this round of dots right here, you tape, you tape down the orientation so that it doesn't slide. You know, like we were talking about, I think it was Steve Levine uh, with Eastman and Laird who lettered his first stuff with Eastman on, on Ninja Turtles and his lines, like the, every row was di sized a little differently. He either did not use an Ames lettering guide or his wheel wasn't, wasn't taped down uh, enough. So, or his studio mates were playing games yeah, whenever he would turn his back. <laughs> shooting air guns with Adam and stuff. <laughs> and re-taping yeah, just, it. Just turn it a tiny there. bit. <laughs> so uh, this second row of dots is, is the ones to use. Uh, yes, you see right here, it's basically telling you, there's like a little indicator telling you to skip that middle dot. You don't, you don't need it. No, what you might use that for is if you were doing like lowercase. Yeah. Because I'm, this I'm is another... Um, use this bottom one because it's, it's Drafting bigger. tool. Yeah, I'm gonna use this bottom. Well, it's actually not bigger. Okay, you know what? This is this is my my smallest. Uh, this is my whisper right. Ames lettering guide, so it's not gonna I'm not gonna be able to do too much. But uh, you know, you give yourself three three rows with each one, and then this one that we did not use, you you si you put it over top of the last line that you drew, so that that gives you the exact right. space. So you letter here. Let me use a little fine liner. You letter here. Now I'm far away. I'm not able to see so well, so it's going to be very, very messy. And uh, I'm blind enough that that this is already fuzzy to me from this distance that I'm at. And you know, we're showing these tools and kind of talking about tools that have been used over the years. You can set up templates. If you're working digitally, yeah. you could set up a layer that has your lettering guides that you create digitally. It's the same exact principle Which because is a, it's spacing. And, and you know, that's a conversation. We could have that conversation later because what you can do, what, what I did with my daily strip is I blew up a Coral Burks page to the size I wanted to draw. And then I, I took it into Photoshop and then I adjusted, like I created a guide using his exact lettering size. So, you know... This lets you know where to letter, and then you you put this dot, and you could you could see where you're lined up by kind of going like that, and see if you're a little too low, a little too high. Make sure you, make sure it's perfect, and then you could start your next round of uh, lines for your guide. Yeah, and so here's a tip: if you're uh, super nerdy. I would look at like Mike Royer used to letter Kirby stuff in the 70s. Yeah. And he would talk about like if you had two word balloons like this, one of them's this way, he would then lower the next word balloon yeah. so that the lines weren't parallel across the page. Yeah. Subtle detail, but if you want to get into detail in comics, lettering is where you can just go, re like you can really feed the OCD monster. Yeah, these have an incredible function also. Uh, and it's for, it's for your balloon. It's for your like bubble letters and things, man. A letter like an E... has one, two, three, four, five, six, six, six lines high. And that's your most kind of complicated amount of like spaces and, and things. So playing around with these at various intervals can give you interesting font possibility. So give yourself six. I'll do a one, two, I'll skip two, skip two. And then like with the, uh, what the old timers would do sometimes, man. Like they could get italics. Right. Using this thing. Or or your triangle. You know, <laughs> like that. Even just simply that. And then and then with with your with your uh hard line. E E E Now we're going real quick here, but you see how it works. And then, so it's all kind of built off of that kind of model. Uh, for my pa for my borders, my uh, balloons, Jimmy, I have a number of t of templates and it, like ellipse templates and things that I use of all different stripes. 
with the daily strip that I'm doing right now though, I'm actually doing these pill shaped uh, lettering balloons that are straight at the top and bottom and have uh, circled, um, like rounded off like edges. But it's very simple. You got your ellipse template. Give lots of air to mm -hmm. to your lettering. That's the Dave Sim method, you know? Like all the best uh, cartoonists will do that. And then uh, you don't close it off. And then with the same ellipse template, you don't fucking do straight edges with the tails, man. You just hit it a little like that. I do a ton of word balloons with the French curve, and it's kind of the exact same method as what you would do the tail, what you just showed the tails. Yeah. Because you're just taking a little piece of the curve that you think you like. Right. Um, you know, it would be something like you have your some kind of rough box, right, of what it's going to be, and then you find the French curve that roughly matches parts of that oval. And just keep it going. Yeah, basically you're just kind of going to do a couple of curves. The fewer curves that you can use, of course, is the better results. And often I will try to repeat the curves on the opposite sides, you know, so that the they're kind of complementary to one another. And it's not perfect, but I also don't know that it has to be. Like part of the reason that I do this rather than doing an oval is uh, I like the imperfection a little bit. Yeah. You know, it gives it a little bit more of an organic feel, but you can still have a very tight shape, you yeah. know, a very tight uh, curve on it. So cheated there at the end, but that's basically the French curves and it works for anything round. If you're doing like a wheel in perspective, if you're doing some kind of curved piece in perspective, you don't always have the perfect circle to use. And so you find the different angles on the French curve. And like I say, you may do a couple of them. Works with a pen, not a tool for a brush. No, I've, I've tried that. I've oh, learned yeah. that. <laughs> and, and let me get this, man. So like all of the best templates, and triangles and French curves, they all have a little system built in so that you can use ink with them. And uh, you need to ink on a raised surface. Yes. It cannot It cannot be flat against mm -hmm. the page like your, your little ruler that you used as a kid. Uh, it has to be raised a little bit. And some of these are built in with you know that raise. And if, but if you don't, let me go get my tr <laughs> my trusty uh, ruler, man. Go vamp a little bit. Yeah, this is this is good stuff because uh, I know exactly what Ed's going to bring out here. But yes. in the meantime, let me put this down. You guys can pause your screen if you're trying to figure out the Ames Lettering Guide is a weird tool. This is your instruction booklet that comes with the Ames Lettering Guide, so you can pause the screen and read that if you want to get more into the details of what this tool does because it does a lot. This is a very remarkable robust tool to have in your collection. So this, how, this is how we used to create a nice. raised surface in, in, in Homestead, man. Uh, this is a flat ruler. It's flat against the surface. You cannot ink against it because what will happen is the ink will escape underneath and it'll spider web out and things. So it, it costs four cents <laughs> to, to raise the surface. <laughs> to go um, from the uh, kid level ruler to professional grade. <laughs> yeah, man, it'll, it'll cost you four, four pennies. Uh, but that's all it is, man. It just just tape some pennies underneath, and uh, you'll always have that raised surface so that you can ink and never worry about any kind of bleed or anything. But yeah, if you're buying the tools and you get the beveled edge, always go for that beveled edge. I think for the most part, we've we've covered the basics, but now now we got we got to get into the true arc arcana of artisanal comics and uh, maybe even some stuff that is flat out antiquated. Uh, I talked about this proportion wheel we called it a reduction wheel uh a bunch of times and i don't know what kind of like pythagorean theorem or whatever is built into this but it is they figured out the math of enlarging and reducing which has totally gone away with the simplicity of photoshop uh but it is this is what dave gibbons needed when he was doing 10 roughs that were exactly proportional to comic pages uh, to blow up, to trace off or whatever. Uh, he didn't trace, but if you were going to, uh, you would use you would use the proportion wheel. And this was something that we had as a side arm at all times for those exact reasons, man. Like I built a rough panel, um, a, a, a thumbnail uh, design on small paper, and I arrived at the amount that I needed to blow it up using the proportion wheel. We'll be real simple here. 
Okay, so the small circle, there's a little rotating wheel. The small circle gives you the size of your original. So let's take a simple number, 10 inches. We wanna blow that up to 15 inches. So this is the size of what you want your final piece to be, this, out, this outer circle. You put the 10 on the 15, and then you know when you go to a Xerox machine and you take your little thumbnail, you need to blow it up 150%. Very simple. And, it, and you could get super complicated, you know, like uh, an original piece of comic art has a 15 inch height. What's the size on uh, your standard comic, Jimmy? 10 and a quarter. Okay, so let's take it to about 10 and a quarter. It reduces almost uh, a little less than 70%. And so that lets you know, you know, how, how little you need to reduce it. This has gone away, like Photoshop takes care of that so easy. Yeah, the tool that I didn't bring, but this makes me think of it is the color wheel. And I can remember mm -hmm. talking to Steph Stephanie Busima and she was talking about how much she uses a color wheel as a painter. And it's, it's funny not to include that. I, and I guess a lot of cartoonists don't color their own stuff, but if you do, it's a really great tool. If, uh, if you don't have one handy, just as a quick, easy reference reminder. Can we start getting into esoterica? So some, some, some crazy shit? Go deeper. Let's go cre into some crazy shit, man. Making a splatterpunk gory comic frisket can be applied. Uh, and I, I have two kinds of friskets, man. We will not be using the liquid frisket here, uh, but it is, it goes on. You could draw over top of it and then you use this little eraser thing which is like the same thing as a paper cement eraser to get the boogers off. Uh, you, you also want one of these things. I don't even exactly know what you call it, but um, if you were patching up artwork and you were using paper cement, you run this across, it gets the remnants of the paper cement off. It's very, very, it's not sticky, but it has like a sticky-ish feel to it. I don't know what, how else to describe right. it. Uh, that said, we can we can play with a little bit of uh, the screen frisket. Comes in a couple different. Comes on a rule. This was uh, printed. This was created by by Graphics, the same company that did Duo Shade. Uh, mm. They're still in business, and uh, this is one of the things that they do still make. It's uh, it's it's a it's a sticker, and uh, airbrush artists use it a lot to kind of uh, section off different colors and things. Uh, it comes in different tackiness and this is not a good one this is this is extra tacky but that's okay because what you would do is you cut off the shape that you need and then with when you get one that's too tacky and if it's too tacky it doesn't pull off the paper so easy so you gotta put some oil on it get yeah get some schmutz on there to kind of like lessen the tack i always bit. put stuff like that on a pant leg yeah. or on a shirt, shirt you know just yeah. a little bit of lint will take some of uh -huh. that stickiness away boom put it down something and you were like you had your flickety flick that's uh, when you always see people brush is uh, doing the splatter effect and you're doing some splatter and then you want ink all over this side here all over this side here but this is like you know illumination from inside of a triangle shaped doorway in the sky right and then you peel off your uh your frisket yeah you mentioned airbrush I think before we started recording, we were talking about some painters that we see that use this technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, so if you're following painters and you'll see their progress, sometimes this is a tool that they're using to work on one part of their canvas or on their artboard, but keep the rest of it clean until they're ready to go to that part. Brian Bolin mentioned it in our Killing Joke uh, conversation because he used airbrush on a lot of his stuff. And he said that the masking off part of the thing takes all the time Yes. because the airbrush is Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's just that, but uh, cordoning off, you know, uh, Joker's skin, yada, yada. Yeah, all the foreground elements and stuff. So keeping in line with graphics, the company, uh, the duotone, the long ar gone, archaic, uh, mechanical process of uh, duotone, which is very much not available to you in an analog format in any form or fashion. you got to unearth this stuff. Uh, it was an actual paper that was chemically treated. Uh, there would be it would the paper would look appear white, but you you look close and you could see undeveloped lines. Came with two chemicals, one chemical you put it on. It gives you it develops one set of the lines. You put on uh, the stinkier chemical. <laughs> it develops both. 
you can see how corrosive this stuff is mm. uh, to to the paper. It's not archival by by any stretch. We had people send us samples of this stuff uh, in early days, yeah. And then we would have professionals tell us, "Don't use that in a in a closed room." Yeah, uh -huh. uh, highly toxic. Some of these chemicals. So yeah, you know, it, it, it has gone away, but it was around for decades. Absolutely. Like even back into the 30s, you'll see it in a lot of the comic strips. So what you're looking at here, uh, this these are the the sort of templates that I created for myself. The palette I created for myself for my Red Room comic to to have a uh, a duo tone. Um, it, it took. It took all restraint to not do like a six page comic mm -hmm. using this stuff and just shading in what I needed to. You know, it's this is like that, that marshmallow uh, psychological test. You restrain that impulse to just develop six whole sh sheets, three of each color, and scan it in so that you can make 400 pages mm -hmm. of comics, infinite amounts once you develop it. What's the purpose, you might ask? You could just do this in the computer. No, you can't, because I want some unevenness. I, I make organic comics. I make artisanal comics. And uh, the hand is important to, to be visible. So having some unevenness to it, having some thicker parts, having some pieces of paper where it doesn't quite pick up all of those strokes is very important to me. I don't want it to be perfect, because if I did, I would just use the computer. But the organic nature of comics making is why I'm in it. I'm not in it to play around on the computer that much. And this material, an MVP of the 80s black and white explosion, following yeah. in the path of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, a lot of people would add mm -hmm. this. And it would really bring a richness to that artwork because it would give you these different shades of gray to play with. Not the only way to get gray no. on a, uh, a, a comic book page. Uh, Zipatone or, or Letratone. Or at this point, the leader uh, will 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 do you some good. Uh, coming in all shapes and sizes, all sorts of dot patterns, different sizes of dots. For go back to your proportion, will how much are you going to reduce this stuff? Yeah. Because if you get this wrong and the reduction is too great, what you end up with is what's called a moray pattern. Yeah. And that's where you're getting something else in addition to the dots. Whenever yeah. It's printed. We're seeing it on the we, screen. Yeah. I was going to say we might be seeing a moray pattern. Yeah, it could be. And and if not, when you you can't really butt up. Zipatone dots on top of one another because it will create a more automatically, which is what you see here with our eyes. N the monitor's a little smeary, so maybe the camera's picking that up. Uh, the 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 best way to use this stuff for getting the most bang for your buck is to start in a corner when you're cutting off the shapes that you need. Don't start here. Start in a corner and just work your way over. And then, as you pull stuff off, put it back down. This material was very expensive. Uh, like, this, the actual Zipatone, Zipatone, in the, even the 80s, could be 8 bucks a sheet. So, uh, make it last. Uh, you might need just that much. Mm -hmm. So, you don't have to chomp it off the, 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 the big piece. You could just hit it there. Now, and as Ed said, you can still buy this deleter, probably being the big one. Um, I would recommend scanning them before you cut any out. Yes. I have a pretty good digital collection of all of my screen tones for that reason. It's nice to put them on the actual art. I enjoy how that looks. But in terms of use, you can digitize these and then uh, like that duo shade, it'll give you something that's a little bit more organic than a digital version. Absolutely. Uh, this is from my last round of uh, Manga Quest where I wanted interesting textures. Uh, at Sakaido, the big art store, there's a whole aisle five, six, seven hundred different patterns. Most of them useless to me, but maybe a checkerboard. I remember Akira pieces that had that. Uh, some some speed lines. Yeah. It's nuts to me how many versions of this stuff exist. And whenever you start looking at your, your mangas and you see some of the elaborate backgrounds, mm -hmm. how like, about this? It's yeah. all there. Th this made me think Joe Sh Sacco should do this. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> like just just have pages of... Of, uh, it makes me think I've been fooled once or twice with some of what mm -hmm. I think is hatching, but totally. maybe it's not. Look at that, man. You draw your character in a run pose and then just yeah. put that on there. Put your flash on top of that. I got a lot of these uh, blendy ones. Yeah, those gradients are good Good at selling the lie, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Yeah, every pattern you can imagine. Cheetah prints, because I can imagine drawing a Peg Bundy type chick <laughs> one time that's going to have that gear. Camo. Some more of those drawn, mm -hmm. like uh, drawn organic lines. Some speed 
lines or bursties, some more drawn lines. This is a nice pattern. I like this. White, yeah. White noise like. Yeah. And you'll see these in all of your manga. I can't imagine what this looks like on screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you're moving this back and yeah. forth. I'm sure it's crazy moray patterns coming in and out. In the old days, though, man, you had your lecture tones. And this, like, what, what you're looking at here, like, I just buy chunks off of eBay. Like, the stuff comes up. Old dudes are getting rid of uh, their old stock. They, they've gone fully digital. And... Uh, when making artisanal comics, these are hand-done comics, and you want some fuss and muscle on the page. Here, this will be a good moray, because it's doing it to my eyes right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are fantastic patterns. And at this point, like, if you get your hands on one of these lots off of eBay, it can add a pretty unique piece to your comics now, because this is not a common tool at this point. You know, in the past, you might have looked at it and thought, oh, it's mechanical, why don't you draw it? But now it almost brings that extra level of craft to your comics. Yeah. Let your... Set, let your Letcher said is the company, and uh, m most known for their vinyl lettering. Uh, this is, you just burnish this on. You you put this uh -huh. over top. You you could use the Ames guide to create a line, like use the back back of your. Uh, yep, that's that's right. Exacto to just push that lettering uh, onto the paper. The nice thing and with using letters like this is that you're going to have that human hand, like that warmth part, because they won't be 100% perfectly lined yeah. up no matter how good you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the spacing in between the letters will be a little bit different, mm -hmm. and it can really create kind of a nice, again, it just, it takes what could be a dull mechanical feeling and gives it a little bit of warmth. Yeah, and once again, same deal, like I just scoop these up whenever I see them. I can't remember if we said it on, on the record or not, but like I've bought pen nibs that way, where you just go on eBay and you buy like a lot of old pen nibs. Uh, for that same purpose. So this is like the newest piece to the puzzle for me, man. This is the all-star uh, piece. This is what people, are, the King K Fabers are clamoring to see this thing. Yeah, but uh, do you got some more stuff over there, Jimmy, to, to show off? Let's, maybe we should do that first. I'm going to need that. While we're talking oh, lettering, yes, 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 yes. It's, it's worth pulling out an Ames lettering guy. Yes. This was sent uh, Leroy, to me. Leroy, Leroy letter, letter. Yeah, letter my guy. fault. Yeah, this is the EC. This was sent to me from Sisters in Christ. Yes. And, um, a mostly intact. We're missing. I'm missing a couple of the pen nibs. So those nibs come in different sizes, but they outline like which of these tracks to use with which size pen nibs. And then this is your device to actually rule out your lettering. And I'm going to show how to use it, but uh, I'm going to grab mine because, like, mine is. You'll see. Yeah. Dude, look how deluxe your kit is. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a Leroy Two lettering set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The two has advantages. And here are the advantages. By the way, I've got the uh, the guide, the, the tips of how to actually use this kind of came in a booklet. And this is another one of those drafting Look at tools. This shit. <laughs> is, it, is it just like uh, Fast Eddie or like it's, some it's full so deluxe. Yeah, it is. So what makes this one sick as fuck? Oh, wow. Is that, they, well, I'll show you how to use it real quick. Boom, that T-square, super important. Your letter forms. And then you keep, you keep one stylus in this level. Like this, so that you stay level with the page, and then the other one traces your letter forms when you have your tip in here, and you keep you keep this against the paper so that you know like this is level with the pen nib. But what else is cool with it is, uh, and you'll see it in EC Comics, is you have to italicize. So you play around with this wheel here, and then you you kind of move things. So now you, you would get like an italic. Very, if you want to talk about esoterica, uh -huh. it doesn't get more esoteric. Yeah, I had mine running one day and I thought, oh, I'm going to see how this actually works. And you you come away with a mad respect for the uh -huh. guys who could do this fast enough to be a profession. Unbelievable. Yeah. And the artist editions do not help because the, the like eyeballing the spacing between letters is not intuitive eyeballing hitting the top of, or, or the bottom line of your guideline not intuitive and having accurate space in between rows is not intuitive and it's not an easy thing to to set up yeah it's very hard to manipulate um it makes me wonder you know there are those drafting tables that have like the two cables right. for your straight edge and i wonder if that's something that's used better with the lettering guide because it's just too much stuff to like hold your t-square uh -huh. tight but then you've got this other piece that you're manipulating and moving you really need three hands, I think, to make it work. Yeah. 
So, Jimmy, can you give me those uh, those two uh, sharpened red and blue lead, lead deals that you set up? Uh, this is like some kind of a naval mapping tool. Like, I don't know what it's called. I saw Daniel Warren, Warren Johnson using it while he was penciling, and I was like, I need to get one of those things. Somebody mentioned what it was in the comments. I tried to get... I tried to find something online that would approximate that same mm -hmm. deal. And this thing does not work because it's uneven in the spacing, as you could see when I pull it open like that. Like it's, you need, you need the, you need the stuff to be even for it to be accurate for, for our good, good red room reference though. I, I know, like right? could be a tool used in a, in a decent red room. Yeah, it looks a nuts like teeth at the top something. of it. <laughs> Even this thing does. It looks like a piece of dental equipment from the 1800s. Jeez. So uh, this is a cheat code for perspective. Oh. And what you do, uh, professionals use it. Once you once you see what I'm going to do, and you look at original art of people you like, you're going to know that you're going to know the dudes who do it or not. Uh, so you don't have to be exactly accurate to the top and bottom of a panel. But you set it up, and then you now have a set of very evenly spaced guides. You shrink it up over here. And maybe maybe you put your your small ones first, and then you have your guides for this side, and then you just you just match each you match each one up with its corresponding. So like the first one, you go with the first guide on the other side. Boom, boom. You see, you see what I'm getting mm -hmm. at here. We'll do the whole thing, and, and I'll show you like where the uh, having two run in of different colored uh, lines has lots of value. But what we're doing is we're gridding it off so that you don't have to keep your paper t taped down, and that's something that I always str struggled with and like always hated. Uh, you would run, you would run a similar set over here, so that you would be able to like you know, get, get lines here. Like you would have to run in a fresh one, but I'm just going to kind of cheat a little bit to, to sort of show you. It's so light, but, um, you know, you, so you'll never get confused basically. And then, you know, you would run your, your up and downers. It's, it's impossible to do. Well, for the purposes of this, I'm just going to stick with that. So, because it's more visible. By the way, hold on. Stop, stop with the verticals. Yeah. So, if you're doing perspective like a wall or something that's going back, once you have your your going to the vanishing point line, then this is how you would run your distance in perspective. Right. You know, your verticals would be ruled this way, and that would give you the perspective of, say, bricks in a wall. For right. A very easy example of how you mark perspective going back on a wall of equal distances yeah, totally which is important that which is why it's important to have the accurately spaced exactly this, because you get a lot with that you get um you get proper ellipses yes that are for your car tires and things will kind of fit within that space uh because what did we learn from how to draw comics the marvel way a perfect circle fits in a perfect square so if you have a perfect square in perspective then uh, to create a perfect circle in perspective, it's got to kind of fit within that. Uh, what else do we have, man? Any, anything, any any quickies, man? It's real fun showing off this old arcana uh, when it comes to comic book making. I don't think I have anything major. This was one of the first tools I was ever given. This came to me from my grandmother whenever it was made clear that, oh, I like to draw. Yeah. So this was an old uncle's drafting kit probably from uh, the compass, 40s or 50s. Yeah. And the compass is one of those tools that, you know, if you want to make a circle of any size, that's what you use. Um, I rarely use a compass. I just don't love them. I end up using circle templates, yeah. sometimes coffee mugs or saucers, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the size, I prefer a physical object I can trace around. This is this, dope. This is a rule called a ruling pen. Yes. And you can put ink or paint, like acrylic paint in there. You can open it up to different sizes. And because it's metal on the edge, you can use that on a straight edge. You could use it on a French curve and you would see it in like sign painters. It's an old design, all of these old drafting tools. Yeah. 
Yeah, totally. And, uh, you know, this means that you could ink a perfect circle when you mm -hmm. put it in the compass. It doesn't right. always have to be a pencil. Uh, we're running low on time, so we should uh, get out of here. Kayfabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. Cartoonist Kayfabe Comic Book Christmas in July is coming to you this last Saturday in July. We are going around town. We are putting free comics into the free little lending libraries in our neighborhoods. And uh, we are spreading the word of comic book awareness. Join our Patreon. Uh, you become a King Kayfaber there. You're going to to have access to all these videos before anybody else. But the vids are brought to you by the books that we make. Uh, Jimmy, what you got? My next book, Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. You can pre-order that now. It'll be out this fall from Image Comics. It collects all the Street Angel comics that are not in Deadly Squirrel Alive. Deadly Squirrel Alive just reissued from Image. So if you missed the first printing, we got a new copy available. You can also pick up Hulk Grand Design and the Plain Janes and True Crime Funnies, my self-published new comic book of nonfiction comics. It has sold out the first printing, but a second printing is on its way, and you can download the digital files at my website or on patreon.com slash jimrug, where I serialized all these comics and all my future comics. What are you hustling, Tom? Uh, Pre-order Jack Kirby's Star Warriors, starring Adam Starr and the Solar Legion from Image Comics. It's a, a, uh, an, an old, new Jack Kirby comic, a, a, a lost Kirby classic. Uh, I also have I Am Stan, uh, uh, the story of Stan Lee coming soon, and a paperback edition of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. Christmas in December is going to bring you a couple of Ed Piscor efforts. Uh, the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus coming to you in October. 504 pages, collecting all four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree with 140 pages of additional materials. Uh, put in your orders and pre-orders for that. Same deal with the X-Men Grand Design Trade paperback coming out in November. Just in time for uh, the holidays. Uh, some of this is out of print, so it's all coming back in trade paperback form. I'm doing Red Room now. Two trades of that are out there. Two issues of the current season of Red Room are out there. Make sure you get Crypto Killers number three because it's uh, the introduction of the characters I'm using in my comic strips that I'm going to begin serializing on my Patreon and then to the wider world at a later date. But Jimmy, there are some other ways uh, people can help out the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, stickers, and more at our spread shop that link is also under this video all good ways to support the channel give them those marching orders and we'll be on our way make more comics